All right, let me do my super eye patch wolf voice real quick. <clears throat> it is Christmas of 1999. Sega, one of the zeniths of the gaming industry, is slowly turning into Ozymandias. What was once a global empire was beginning to crumble away as though it never existed. The Sega Dreamcast, Sega's last bastion of hope, had just been released two months prior in America, whereas it was over a year old in Japan. Sonic Adventure have released two rave reviews, but it wasn't enough to save the sinking Sega ship. The Dreamcast needed a killer app, a defining video game that would not only revitalize Sega, but also the gaming industry as a whole. A title that would be held in regards as games such as Ocarina of Time and Metal Gear Solid. That game would be known as Shenmue. Years ago, I was Chinese. Now, I'm a naturalized Japanese. Is that so? Thank you. I love Shenmue so much, dude. This is not a bit I genuinely have so much love and respect for this game. And it's not a nostalgia thing either. My first experience with Shenmue was five years ago with the HD releases back in 2018. By that point, I've already played amazing games that were conceptually similar to Shenmue's, such as Rhythm Heaven Fever and Final Fantasy 16. Shenmue kind of serves as a time capsule from the era in which it was released, and it still warrants a look today. It's a game that was lovingly crafted by Yu Suzuki, who was the guy behind Virtua Fighter. Now see, I can't comment too much on the Virtua Fighter games, as the only one I played was the one included in Lost Judgment, but this must have been amazing for kids in 1993. In 1993, I didn't exist, so I wasn't able to play it at launch, but the idea of 3D graphics and techniques based on real-world fighting styles must have been mind-boggling. Virtua Fighter itself is what directly led to the development of Shenmue, as the game was originally known as Virtua Fighter RPG Akira's Story, starring Akira from Virtua Fighter. It would have had Akira going through the four stages of grief following the murder of his father grieving, going to China, killing the guy who killed his dad, and hanging out with a homie. This is actually the hero's journey for people who watched Old Boy. Yu Suzuki would hire a screenwriter, a playwright, and multiple film directors to pen the story of Shenmue, and no discredit to those guys, but I admittedly didn't love Shenmue for the story, I loved it for everything else. But that's besides the point. It really just boggles my mind how much work was put into this game. Like, I know video game development is a costly and time-consuming endeavor that only got more difficult as time went by, but like, Jesus Christ, they made 300 characters for this game. They all got names and personalities and they all hang out and eat lettuce. Most of them only have textures for faces and the only moving parts are their mouths, but that's okay, the people of Yokosuga are just like that. Oh, dude, speaking of, right, when I started up a new game for this video, I found out that the game actually offers you the chance to play through it with the actual recorded weather that Yokosuka experienced during 1986, in addition to, like, the day and night cycles. All of the cutscenes in the game are in-engine, meaning they weren't FMV-like titles like Final Fantasy VII, which is insane, because that combined with the weather effects means that every cutscene has the potential to be day or night, sunny, raining, snowing, it really adds to the experience. Motion capture itself was used to make sure Ryo and his buddies were well-versed in Budo, but it can look a little janky. It's absolutely insane that the team was able to pull this off, and I remember it blew my mind when I first played this in 2018. And I also played Red Dead Redemption 2 that same year, and absolutely loved that game. So, it's nice to know that video games are still great after 20 or 30 years. Video games are also damn expensive, this game cost 70 million dollars to make. Yu Suzuki claimed that it's actually closer to 47 million when you take marketing into account, but that's still way too much money for two games. 
I specified two because some of the money went towards Shenmue 2, but the expenses of these games in addition to the declining Dreamcast sales did not do Shenmue many favors. Man, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page, right, for like most expensive video games ever made, and I gotta ask, why did Genshin Impact cost 100 million dollars to make? The characters got like two models for guys and three models for girls, whereas Shenmue has many models. I think Shenmue clears, I'm afraid. Oh, and speaking of afraid, the game kind of starts with this Chinese guy beating up our dad, and Ryo is on the floor crying and throwing up and gagging, and his dad is like, yeah, I'll never tell you where the mirror is. And this guy Lan Di goes, bet, and he's gonna eat Ryo before his dad goes, wait, 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 wait. Lan Di throws Ryo into a pit, and his dad's like, Ryo, my fault, and then he dies. Right off the bat, you're introduced to one of the most infamous aspects of Shenmue, the voice acting. Close to you. Uh, no. Father. No! And I'm playing in English because I'm correct, but the Japanese dub is technically better. I just think the English dub is way more charming. Jeremy Blaustein, the head of Shenmue's localization, said that Yu Suzuki insisted that all the English voice acting was done in Japan, with Blaustein straight up saying, we hired every English speaking person in Japan that called themselves a voice actor. People love to rag on this game for its voice acting, but I think it genuinely adds to the charm. It like makes everyone feel weird and dreamy like I'm in Twin Peaks. Do you know him? Charlie! He wears sunglasses, a black leather jacket, and has a tattoo on his arm. No, I don't know him, man! Really? This is made even better by our protagonist, Ryo. I'm not a doctor, so I can't formally diagnose him, but I swear to god he has to be on some type of spectrum. Hi. Hi there! Where are you going? It's a secret! Is that right? Don't stay out too late. Okay! He's adorable and endearing. I love how stanced he is. His broad shoulders are probably the reason why the game kind of controls wonky. Like, not exactly tank controls, but it feels stiff. It starts you off in the Hazuki estate, and you can use the left trigger to go into this first person mode and fiddle around with stuff. Every single closet and cabinet in this game has some level of interaction, and sometimes you can find some pretty funny stuff laying around. I found a Sega Saturn and some Sega batteries, which is quite humorous because in 1986, batteries didn't exist. Sometimes inspecting an object can trigger a scene or a flashback, like this scene where Ryo's dad sentences Ryo to death for not eating carrots. Ryo, while you're still sleeping in bed, farmers are working hard in the fields, carefully picking carrots one by one. So how can you waste them like that? You get the scene in the kitchen where Ine-san typically hangs out. Ine-san is Ryo's caretaker and she's constantly working around the house to deal with the depression of Ryo's dad dying. She always wants you home by 11pm and I never had the heart to ever break her curfew. Her voice acting always made me sad. And because I don't want you to upset the spirit of your father. Please. She leaves out 500 yen for you every day to use, and I always do the right thing and spent it all on Sonic Gachapon. Fukusan was another disciple of Ryo's dad and wants to avenge him alongside Ryo, who promptly shuts him down. Oh, be sure to tell me. Ryo-san, why? What you gonna do? Ryo-san, where are you going? You're not going after them. You keep track of every little thing in your notebook, which I think adds some more personality to Ryo. The song that plays in Shenmue 1 is so dramatic and melancholic, and I like it a lot. But in Shenmue 2 and 3, it's replaced with this rendition that utilizes Chinese instruments. Speaking of, 
We gotta go find out about those Chinese people that killed Ryo's dad. So Ryo does the next best thing and invades Yokosuka and harasses the townspeople about any and all information that they may have. This, my friends, is the crux of Shenmue. You ask questions, you get answers. You ask more questions, you get more answers. Shenmue 2. This game is essentially a walking simulator, if you think about it, which I know is not everyone's seen, but I love games like Dead Stranding, so I kind of have the patience for this sort of thing. But I will admit that during this replay of Shenmue, I found myself bored at times when I had to wait for like certain restaurants to open up late at night, so I just play on like my fidget cube or something while cutscenes played out. Man, speaking of, I hate games like L.A. Noir and Shenmue, because they rewire my monkey brain to pick up objects like a caveman, or like more specifically, how Ryo does. This is cool. After we hit up Tom at the hot dog stand and Nozomi, Ryo's not girlfriend, we are informed that we should probably ask Chinese people about where to find Chinese people. Upon this revelation, Ryo's first thought is, let me go to a Chinese restaurant, the workers are always Chinese. It's also how you get that infamous line from earlier. I swear to god bro, no one gives you a straight answer in this damn game, cause next thing you know you gotta find out about the three blades, named for a barber, a tailor, and a chef. At this point, you're probably fumbling through the town and you're thinking to yourself, I really wish this game had a mini-map, but I'll be honest, you kind of learn the layout of the town mentally as you go through it. There's some maps available in the public here and there, but for the most part, you're on your own, buddy. But Yokosuka is relatively small, so you get accustomed fairly quickly. The game also has the courtesy to instantly teleport you from the Hazuki residence to places of interest at the start of new days, so you don't gotta make your way into town every single day. I've never been good when it came to remembering names and media that I consume, but I really do enjoy how so many townsfolk just recognize Ryo, and he refers to them by name, and they refer to him by name. Like this pink-haired guy and the scowling army dude. It really cements that small town feel that the game has, and I find it super endearing. There's a cute little cat by a shrine that you can hang out with throughout the game, and just like Ryo, this cat's family was killed by Chinese people, so I did the right thing of naming the cat Sasuke, because Itachi was probably Chinese too. There's arcades in this game too, where you can play games like Hang On, or practice your reaction skills with quick time events. Yeah, this game is one of the first examples of QTEs in a video game, and I'm not too big on them to begin with, and I'm not a fan of them in Shenmue. My main beef with them is how the button prompt just kind of flashes onto the screen instead of remaining static. It can be really difficult to see what exactly you have to press in the heat of the moment. It's best you get used to them though, because QTEs are used throughout the story. Like this instance in which you have to enter a bar to find out about a sailor named Charlie who is involved with the Chinese cartel. All the information you have to go off of is that he's a biker and he has a big old tattoo on his arm. So you gotta make like a Japanese schoolboy and figure out what the hell is going on. There's a lot of really small interactions within Shenmue that make me happy. Like this dude who's really thirsty and asks Ryo for a drink. Honestly, Ryo's a better man than me, because I would've told this loser to look up at the sky and open his mouth to the rainfall, but Ryo is more than happy to buy this dude a coke. Yeah, in the HD remasters they got rid of product placement, so the soda was actually coke in the original version, but here it's just Jet Cola, named after the Cowboy Bebop character. That was a lie, but you can choose to engrave that into your beliefs. Alongside drinks, there's a bunch of places to get food in this game, and everyone's a menace, dude. Mario, would you teach me some Italian? Oh, of course! Buono means good! Okay, thanks. Tomato Mart is also a joint that I love hanging out in. They got all sorts of goodies, and you could terrorize the employee too by asking her Rio's insane questions. <sighs> Alright, let's see here. You know, while I'm waiting for Charlie to show up, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page for Shenmue, uh, specifically this quote by Stephanie Starling, and let me just read it out real quick. Shenmue is dreadful. Maybe at the turn of the millennium, when this game was worth a crap, it could get away with being bold. 
but boldness is no excuse for wasting the player's time, having absolutely no respect for the audience or its patience, and generally expecting people to make their own fun in a game that doesn't really give all that many tools to have fun with. I can kinda see where she's coming from, like, uh, waiting around for time to pass in-game isn't really fun, especially when there's not all too much I can do right now. The game isn't like the Yakuza franchise where like every single title is bursting at the seams with side content and sub stories and like a world to explore. And like speaking of Yakuza, there's been many noted similarities between Shenmue and Yakuza, specifically the condensed Japanese city setting and a protagonist that is definitely on the spectrum. Hell, when you look up Yakuza, there's a section dedicated to the connection to Shenmue. Toshihiro Nogashi, creator of the Yakuza games, has worked with Yu Suzuki in the past, so there's definitely some history between the two. But at the end of the day, these games share a very similar soul, but a different life. If you're a fan of Yakuza, then I say give Shenmue a try if it ever goes on sale. I was making my way back to the Hazuki estate to harass Fukusan, but then some goons were harassing my not girlfriend, so it's up to Kiri, I mean Ryo, to take care of them, and thus, we entered this game's combat. Oh no, oh no, oh no, I'm not good at it. I've seen some cool combos on YouTube, but I honestly just push buttons and I pray to god the enemies go down before I do. Well, with that out of the way, let's keep waiting for Charlie. You know, I'm playing like Fire Emblem Engage while I wait for Charlie to show up, but like, have you guys ever noticed that a lot of discourse surrounding Fire Emblem Three Houses just kind of come from people who only played one route and decided to center their entire opinion of the game and its world from that one route? Thus, inherently proving the game's central point of people just choosing to believe what they want and remaining purposefully ignorant to like the world at large. It's really so- oh wait, hold on, Charlie's here. In a scene that's similar to Earthbound, we get jumped in a back alley by a bunch of Americans before extracting the information that we need, pointing us towards a tattoo parlor in Yokosuka. We find the tattoo parlor and get harassed before being told, hey, come back tomorrow, so I'm like, alright. You know, the game is really beautiful at night. It plays a somber song as you roam the somewhat empty streets, illuminated by beautiful dreamcast lights. From what I've shown off so far, this game may just seem like meandering and waiting, which it kind of is, but I don't know man, I guess it kind of adds to the game's overall charm. I can understand that you might have a limited amount of free time in a week, let alone a day, so you don't want to play a game that consists mostly of waiting and wandering around, but there's something relaxing about it for me. Anyways, it's best to go to bed and wake up bright and early to the casino that opens up at 10am every morning. Ryo is always eager to get up early to gamble. There is also a mahjong parlor, but I never read Akagi, so I never bothered with it. We nearly snapped this dude's arm off before Nozomi is like, Hey Ryo, have you ever considered college? And Ryo is like, I have nothing but enemies in this world. The guy in the tattoo parlor told us to meet up with him the following day, so we just gotta hang around until then. The next day starts with an Uber Eats delivery, with Ryo delivering a beating to Fukusan before Ine-san tells you that she actually ordered Chinese. She gives Ryo a letter his father left him that was written in Chinese, and while she's sobbing, Ryo was like, I can't read Chinese, what do you expect me to do with this? He also promises Ine-san that he won't get revenge, but there's also two other games in this series, so I think he's a pathological liar. Ryo decides to leave a crying Ine-san behind, only to help out a small child that's being attacked by Charlie and his gang. I didn't mention it during the first fight, but it's really funny how you can tell that they did not bother to dub the voices during fights. You got Goon saying Aura Aura and Ryo's Japanese voice actor grunting and moaning. The audio quality for the Japanese dub is much clearer, but the crustiness of the English dub definitely adds to the charm. The kid he rescues happens to be Chinese and Ryo grips the child when faced with his revelation, hoping that he can read the letter that his dad left him. Are you okay? Shishi, thank you. Shishi? Hey, are you Chinese? 
Whether or not Ryo keeps someone in his life is solely dependent on how close they are to the Chinese. After beating this poor elderly Chinese woman within an inch of her life, Ryo was able to find out that the letter just really consisted of a phone number and some weird phrases. There's telephones throughout the game that let you call services such as like the police or the fire department, but for now you just enter the number provided and you get asked the Sphinx's riddles. Hello? Father's heaven. Nine dragons. Mother's earth. Comrades. Thankfully, Egypt is located right next to China, so Rio is able to answer these questions quite easily, pointing him to warehouse number 8 in the nearby harbor. And after a short bus ride on the MTA's finest, Rio finds himself with more questions than answers in a newfound land. We can only walk a few steps forward before Ryo comes across Josuke Higashikata extorting a child from money. Ryo proves that violence is wrong by beating up Josuke aka Goro and getting information about where exactly warehouse number 8 is, which is only down the street. Of course, nothing is ever easy in Ryo's life and it turns out the warehouse number 8 that we're at is the new one and we actually have to go to the old one. I swear to god, Ryo is like really determined and I commend him for that. At this point, I would have just abandoned my quest for revenge and became a Buddhist monk in Tibet. But given its proximity to China, it would only make Ryo even angrier. The harbor has a bunch of fishermen that are friendly and they kind of point Ryo to the right direction, so you don't get lost easily. Oh hey look, it's Tom. He's actually kind of brain dead because he has no idea where the old warehouse district is, but he's like, it's right next to his hot dog stand, like look, here. We're blocked off by this jabroti and Ryo goes, okay, let me just wait until tonight, which means we are stuck here until 8 p.m., but there's some things you could do in the meantime. There's a poor homeless man who gets kicked out by some guards, but thankfully he isn't Chinese, so Ryo is capable of showing him empathy and actually buys him a can of coffee. Look, he even writes it down in his journal. There's also an encounter with this lady working here, Hisaka, and her little sister Mai, who is hanging out with some delinquents. I find it really funny that this lady entrusts Ryo, no social awareness Hazuki to handle the situation, but I suppose Ryo has known this girl longer than I have, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. So bright are you? Bastard! I'm gonna kick your ass! Let me go! You shouldn't play with stuff like this. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Ryo, take it easy, you killed these poor girls. Ryo lies about what he did and brushes aside Misaka's worries and goes, Hey, by the way, where's the old warehouse district? By the divine guidance of the Buddha, it just so happens that Misaka had to deliver a parcel to the old warehouse district, giving Ryo a chance to flex his delivery skills. I love that Ryo just openly says his plans to break and enter into the warehouse district, and I love that the guards just don't care. This time we only gotta wait about two in-game hours, so I just wandered around talking to folk and it's raining, but like notice how the rain stops when I'm under an awning. It's like, man, the little things like this really sell the setting as like a living, breathing world honestly. This game got all sorts of little details like this. Once 8pm hits, it's time to burst- oh god damn it I got caught. Now Lon D is gonna eat me. Yeah, uh, when you get caught, it skips a day, and if you somehow take until April to beat this game, Lon D shows up and he kisses Ryo on the cheek and kills him. I thankfully got it on my second try, so I don't have to worry about that. There's this cool droning song that plays as you look around, before Ryo drops a plate on the floor like a damn buffoon. But his feelings of guilt are quickly cast aside when he encounters two Chinese men, Master Chen and Guizong. It's here that we find out that Lan Di only took one of the two instrumental mirrors, and he also happens to be proficient in Jujutsu. We are told to go back home and find the other mirror on our own, so it's up to Ryo's critical thinking skills to figure out where that mirror is. Man, Ryo is so polite, gently opening and closing the doors. If I was on this quest, I'd be like bursting through the walls in anger, dude. Ine-san lets us know that our dad left something for us behind before he died, and we pull up to the local antique shop to see what exactly did he leave us behind. Instead of something useful like a PS5, get this, he left us a sword handle. Not a sword, not a sheath, but the handguard. 
If I was Ryo, I would have just eaten it. Also, a uh, quick tip, you might want to buy a flashlight and a light bulb for the journey ahead. I like that you can buy just like stupid stuff at Tomato Mart, and like it doesn't seem helpful at first, but it actually helps you uh, quite a bit. You could buy some cassette tapes for your Sega Walkman, and you can also buy some move scrolls in the antique shop, which can help prove to be helpful in upcoming battles. On his way home, Ryo gets jumped by Guizong because of course nothing goes right in his life, but it turns out Guizong is set to be Ryo's bodyguard. He's a bit of a fan favorite character, and I agree, I always liked him. I like that he fights in like a full suit, and he's kind of like a funny babysitter that has to deal with Ryo. Oh, and we're also introduced to, uh... <laughs> Landisama, the Phoenix Mirror? <laughs> yeah, him. Uh, don't worry about him. After showing the Oreo that your dad left behind to Ine-san, she's like, hey, why don't you go dunk it in some milk? And by milk, I mean this wall inside the Hazuki Dojo. There's also a treasure chest we gotta open up using this rusty key we found, giving us access to a sword without a handguard. You'd think that, like, we would have to combine the sword with the handguard, but, like, nah, we just gotta use the sword like a key and just accept it. Dude, imagine if, like, the sword broke. Oh, Ryo would be so mad. Once we get past the secret room, we find ourselves in the basement, which is really cool. You can use the flashlight that you bought earlier, and you can screw in the light bulb to illuminate the room. There's a couple of candles and a matchbox laying around, so if you didn't buy the light bulb, you can just light up the candles and use that to light up the room. Ryo smashes a nearby wall with his bare hands, and by bare hands I mean this axe that he found, but then, underneath it all, we finally find it. The Shenmue. Nah, I'm just kidding, it's the Phoenix Mirror. Kind of like when a cat gives you like a dead mouse as a present, Ryo brings this mirror to Master Chen to figure out what's the point of any of this. In an insane piece of foreshadowing, Master Chen states that these mirrors can be used to bring about Chi Yu. This is actually in reference to Chi Yu being on top of the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet metagame as of 2022. And it's really insane that Yu Suzuki was able to foresee this- oh god damn it, it's Gollum and he took the mirror. Yeah, his name is Chai, and he apparently works for Chi Yu, which is valid because, I mean, that, that goldfish little dude is a little funny. Feeling defeated, we go back home and go to bed, and Ryo is tormented even in his sleep because he has this dream sequence of a bird flying close to two mirrors. This is actually meant to symbolize Icarus flying close to the sun, or Yu Suzuki flying too close to the budget. Jesus Christ, he spent a hundred million dollars on this. Oh, speaking of money, Ryo has to, like, get the money to go on a business vacation to Hong Kong, because he just wants to give Landi a little kiss, but Fukusan's like, hey, me too, bro, and Ryo's like, no. There's this great cutscene here where Ryo tries to convince Ine-san to let him go, only for Fukusan to fumble the goddamn load and also get Ryo actually angry at him. The man who killed Hazuki sensei is there. Ine-san, please give him the money for the trip. Idiot. Ryo is generally stoic, so seeing him get actually heated for once is pretty nice. The anger doesn't last long though, as after he sees how much it costs to fly out to Hong Kong, Ryo immediately goes, hey bestie, and Fukusan's like, hey, take my life savings, take them, go kill on D, who cares? Fukusan's a bit of an idiot, but like when you're raised in the Hazuki household, it just kind of comes with the territory. Fukusan's life savings aren't enough. But thankfully, we can harass Ryo's not-girlfriend to figure out how to get to Hong Kong for cheap, which, turns out, all you gotta do is buy a boat ticket which costs about 69,000 yen, which is a little over 600 bucks, which isn't bad, but I still think the PS5 would have been better. Huh? What are you talking about? My Hong Kong ticket I've already paid? Paid who? The woman who... Woman? Don't know no woman. What? You should have taken that PS5, my man. Man, to top everything off, now Sasuke is missing. Thus begins the Sasuke retrieval arc, but unlike the other Sasuke, this one is actually willing to come back home, so thankfully that's settled in like a span of a couple of seconds. Man, I love Ryo. Look, look at his little notes. He's such a dork. Nozomi brought the household some flowers, so now Ryo has some tasty treats to snack on during his boat ride to Hong Kong. As we head to bed, Ryo has another strange dream, this time of Shenhua from Shenmue 2. This might not make too much sense to a first-time player, but then again, Shenhua's on the box art, so like, who knows, man. 
Alrighty, we are up nice and early. It's time to pick up the ticket to Hong Kong. I really hope I don't get jumped. God damn it, I got jumped. Thankfully, Fukusan's able to milk us back to health, and off we go to the travel company. It snowed recently, so like the streets are icy and crunchy. It's really cute. Speaking of crunchy, check out what Ryo What's does to this guy's arm. Damn. We have this chase sequence that's reminiscent of the ones in the Yakuza games, but unlike those games, I keep fumbling, and I cause Ryo to fumble too. And But at the very least, we get one of the funniest lines in the entire game from Ryo. Please don't hurt me! I got a wife and kids! That's your problem. I still don't have the ticket I paid for! Jesus, Ryo, take it easy, man. The poor schmuck points us towards the Mad Angels, a biker gang that harasses workers over at the harbor. So, it's time for Ryo to get a job. Yo, bro! Oh, goddammit, it's Goro. Wait, hold on, hold on a second. Both Shenmue and Yakuza star autistic protagonists with crazy sidekicks named Goro. No way. Anyway, here, Goro promised us a job if we came back the following day, so you could either use this time to, like, explore the harbor, or do what I did and just go and clean my house IRL. At this point, I've just kind of grown numb to waiting in Shenmue. I guess it's like the Stockholm Syndrome at this point, or like Shenmue Syndrome. I timed it, and one hour in Shenmue is four minutes in real world time. That's a, that's a lot of waiting, I'll be honest. But it's fine, at the end of the day, tomorrow brings promises of a new job, so it's best to go to bed as soon as you can. Ryo now has a combination of his past two dreams, combining the Shenmue dream and the bird. This is actually a homage to Eiji Aonuma, who got inspired for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess by having a dream where he turned into a wolf. Somehow Goro was able to pull some strings and land a job for Ryo, but in reality it was Mai who got the job for Ryo, which shows that Goro is dumb and should be executed. And here, we are introduced to one of the most famous aspects of Shenmue. Forklifts. Oh, and we also get my favorite character, Mark. Even if you haven't played Shenmue, there's a pretty good chance you're familiar with the forklifts. In those Sega racing games, Ryo even drives one too. I like that Mark doesn't cast a shadow like he's a vampire. The forklift controls are a bit wonky, but you'll get used to it after doing it enough times, and look, I can never seem to get the crates to line up perfectly, and it pisses me off to no end, but at least I get paid. Just like many of Ryo's other endeavors, his main goal isn't to help people, but to actually prey on the Chinese. In this instance, the Mad Angels have some ties to the Chinese cartel, so snooping around the harbor should point Ryo in the right direction. That homeless guy from earlier is getting chased by some members of the Mad Angels, so Ryo does the right thing and drowns one of the guys to prove a point. You don't even see him resurface, so he's chilling at the bottom of the sea. What a great first day of work. Morning. My new job starts today. He's kind of a freak, huh? I mean, like, if you go to sleep with jeans on, then you should be studied in a lab. The next few days are kind of more the same, but there's something very crucial I need to discuss. Forklift racing. Every morning, before work, you and your homies race around the dock in forklifts. It's so stupid, and I love it. You get a little gacha toy depending on what place you land in, so if you want to get them all, you gotta place in every position. The races help you get a feel for the layout of the harbor, which is pretty important because you're going to be spending your next couple of days here. Hey, my lunch! You ratted us out, didn't you? Are you one of Chin's men? I don't know any Chin. Oh! Oh, really? I don't know. Oh. Hey, quit lying! God, dude, this... Ugh. This scene made me so mad when I first played this game, bro. Mark is such a lovable guy, so whenever I see bad things happen to him, it just makes me punch my walls in anger. Some goons try to get Ryo to pay for insurance, and Ryo uses his cursed technique to splatter their corpses onto the walls. Once you put all the crates into the designated warehouse, there really isn't anything to do until it's time to clock out, so I usually like messing around with the forklift's shadow and just harassing people. Every now and then, you get people who actually teach you new techniques which can be used in battle, but in order to do so, you gotta practice it first. It sucks. 
I'm not good at it, and I think Guizo wants to kill me. That homeless guy also got his own bag of tricks, and he's willing to impart them onto Ryo. I'm gonna keep button mashing during the battles, but I mean, it's nice to have options. Ryo has to be on like Benadryl or something, how is he having these cracked ass dreams? Always dreaming about trees and mirrors, why can't he dream about like the hat man like everyone else? Hey look, it's schoolboy! You guys. What the hell are you doing here? Children shouldn't play around with forklifts. You might get hurt, you know. Ha! God, I'm I'm just trying to do my job. And these goddamn mad angels keep ruining everything. If I was Rio, I'd kill them all, especially when they're beefing with my boy Mark. He seems to have a grudge towards the mad angels, but it turns out it's because Mark's only brother went missing and was probably killed by the mad angels for snitching about an upcoming deal with the Chinese cartel. Thing is, Mark has no idea if his brother was killed or if the person who heard the info was killed, as only one body was ever dumped into the sea. So, looking for your brother. Yeah. My only brother. He's about your age. But now, he's probably at the bottom of the sea. Killed by the Mad Angels. Why would the Mad Angels kill your brother? It appears he may have leaked some important information. Is that why they... Probably. At least as far as I could tell, only one person was killed. So you're not sure? Was the guy who heard the information killed? Or my brother, the one who leaked it? Sometimes after work, you can see Mark looking out into the sea, looking for any signs of his brother. For as much as people like to rag on Shenmue and its voice acting and cast, I still remember this moment five years later. The somber music isn't overbearing, and it's just a genuine moment between two people who suffer through loss. Ryo is focused on revenge, whereas Mark is just trying to cope in his own way and try to continue living. I love this moment a lot, and I just love the small character moments in Shenmue in general. Ryo's interactions with the homeless fella is also fun, like he seems to be aware of Ryo's background, but doesn't give us too much, giving us this nice air of mystery as he teaches Ryo various jujutsu techniques. He also lets us know that the Mad Angels hang out around Warehouse 18 at night, but of course, not tonight, so we gotta come back tomorrow night. Before I headed out, I stopped by the Tomato Mart branch that's here at the harbor, and I turned in a winning soda can that I got earlier. Yeah, vending machines in this game have a chance of giving you a winning can of soda, which can be exchanged for raffle tickets. If you win the raffle, then you actually win a flight to Yu Suzuki's house to give him a kiss on the lips. I was making my way back home, and I found Santa Claus just roaming the streets. He kind of sucks ass though, because the only thing he was trying to give to me was alcoholism. Speaking of gifts, Nozomi pulled up at the harbor the next day to take photos with Ryo. Shy, stand there. Here we go. Both of you get in closer. Smile. That's it. Here goes. <laughs> Ryo is the funniest man alive. There is nothing to smile about in this man's life. There's a kind of nice scene where Nozomi is like, hey, I'm going away to Canada, and Ryo is like, damn, that's crazy, I'm going to avenge my dad. You're given the option to choose between two photos taken of Ryo and Nozomi, and I would always pick the one where Nozomi is closer to Ryo. I like the headcanon that underneath his lack of social awareness, Ryo actually cares about Nozomi. Love is another thing, but I like to imagine he worries for her at the very least. All is fair in love and war, and it's time for the Mad Angels to cast judgment onto Ryo. I like that Ryo just knows how to ride a bike. It's never explained, but it just reminds me of when Cloud is escaping from the Shinra building. After some gentle persuasion to Charlie, Ryo is able to figure out that the Mad Angels are affiliated with both the Wu-Tang Clan and also Lan Di, which is all the motivation Ryo needs to keep living for another week. Oh god damn it, Londi is here now. 
You know, when you're driving around on your forklift, you can press up on the D-pad to honk your horn. You can try to play music like this, or do what I do, and harass other drivers to get off the road to clear the way for big boy Hazuki over here. Sometimes you can come across Goro on your lunch break, and his loud voice goes well with Ryo's personality. Bro! What's up? On patrol, brother! Patrol! Of course, no amount of personality will do you any favors if you keep getting jumped by sailors. The fight choreography for this game is really fun. Like, I mentioned the motion capture earlier, but it really shines in cutscenes like this. The sailors try to threaten Ryo's family, but he only has Ine-san who is depressed and Fuku-san who is Fuku-san, so they don't have much leverage. Mark tips us off to an upcoming meeting concerning the Mad Angels and the Chinese cartel, so that's something to add to our calendar. At this point, the game has just been you working your 9 to 5 with some street fights sprinkled in during your lunch breaks, so in a way it's really realistic to the experience of living in Manhattan. The fifth day is our last day working at the docks, and Ryo has made a lot of progress, befriending the workers and the locals. In the span of five days, Ryo manages to get Goro together with Mai, and I love that Ryo just cannot fathom the idea of this nimrod of a human being getting married that he writes it down in his diary. I swear, Ryo is just a hater. During my lunch break, I got bored, so I just went to go play darts, and then the break ended right when I started playing, bro. It's already this late? The grind never stops, I guess. Got a question. You know about the long jaw? What? What did you say? You know. Man, they just I don't, don't make anything know. easy for hey. us, huh? Turns out the Mad Angels is being ran by Terry Bogard, so finally Ryo will have a worthy opponent. Before scrapping, it's best we stop by Master Chen and figure out what's the best course of action. Turns out the best course of action is to mind your own damn business for once. But this is Ryo we're talking about, so we know how this will go down. I love these. I should buy one. Hmm, I know Man, this. what the hell? After trying to catch some Z's, turns out Nozomi got kidnapped by Golem. We get thrown into a motorcycle segment that reminds me a lot of the similar segment, Final Fantasy VII, so real recognizes real, I suppose. The controls are a bit wonky, but I was playing Hang On earlier, so I'm used to it. Once we pull up to the warehouse, we're greeted by some more members of the Mad Angels, but they might as well be cleaning utensils at this point since I'm so used to mopping the floors with them. Yeah, it's all your fault. So you're Terry- Jesus Christ, this guy is gurgling, bro. Anyways, Ryo and Nozomi recreate that scene from Devilman Crybaby while a romantic song plays in the background, but all I can think about is how pissed Ryo is right now. It's really funny how this game tries to make these two seem like a couple, but then you got characters like Shenhua and Joy and Shenmue too, so it's like, I guess Nozomi can go die. It's hard to go to sleep after something like that, but thankfully Ryo has friends like Tom that are able to pick up on Ryo's troubled mood. He even offers to take Ryo out for lunch. You know, for all his silliness, Tom is a really sweet guy. It helps soften the blow of Ryo getting laid off from his job for constantly killing members of the Mad Angels throughout the harbor. This is your last chance to talk with everyone here, so be sure to give Goro a kiss on the lips before meeting up with Tom, who somehow knows how to talk to Maki. Turns out the kicks are a bit of a parting gift because Ryo and Nozomi aren't the only ones going away, as Tom is leaving back for America. Even though we part ways, you'll still be one of my best friends. You're mine too. What we get is an actually touching scene of Ryo dealing with the loss of his best friend, which was ruined by my DualShock controller running low on battery. 
Throughout this game, Ryo has shown more love and consideration to Tom rather than Nozomi. Sadly, we don't have the time to mourn as it's time for Ryo to square up with Guizong. Basically, Terry told Ryo, you gotta kill Guizong if you wanna see Lan Ti, and Guizong's like, are you serious? But it is one of the most memorable scenes in the game in my opinion. Guizong is in on Ryo's plan, and what follows is another memorable moment in the game, the 70 man battle. Yeah, it's exactly what it says on the tin, Ryo and Guizong gotta rack up a body count of 70 fellas here on the harbor. And speaking of body counts, Terry tries to lay pipe on Guizong, but thankfully Ryo is there to keep Terry in check. After all that said and done, it's time for your final day in Shenmue. Ine-san and Fuku-san give Ryo a little going away money, which is a really sweet moment, but also really funny when you remember that Ryo is traveling to Hong Kong to kill a man in cold blood. Even though I essentially speed ran this game over the course of 4 IRL days, it does feel somber leaving behind the sleepy town of Yokosuka. As Ryo makes his way through the town, you see recognizable NPCs going about their days as Ryo marches forward with a bag over his shoulder. It just serves as a reminder that time will continue to march forward, just like how Lan Di is marching towards its grave. It's funny how, after all these years, I still recognize where the shops and locations are in Yokosuka. I didn't get lost uh, too often on this playthrough, as I already just engraved where everything was in my heart. That's some really serious staying power for such a silly little game. Either way, we're stopped one last time by Guizong, who wants to show us how to fold an omelette. What? Practice is required to master the attack quickly. You must attack him in earnest. I will. Alrighty, now we just gotta board the boat. Oh god damn it, it's him again. Look out! This fight is a bit tricky, so you just gotta redo it constantly until you get it done. He's mad quick. Having Chai as a final boss is a great landmark, as earlier in the game he kinda whoops your ass at the arcade, so it really shows how far both Ryo and you, the player, have come. <laughs> Oh god damn it, bro. I always put down the controller during cutscenes, so I'm always messing up the QTEs. But with the final QTE done, Shenmue is finally over, and all that's left is to watch the last few cutscenes. There's a sweet scene with Nozomi and Ryo at a shrine where Nozomi is wishing for Ryo's safety in his coming days, and even gives him an amulet. Ryo is standing on the boat heading to Hong Kong, while the music swells and Master Chen looks onward with a smile and an unknown narrator reads off what will happen to Ryo. He comes from a far eastern land across the ocean. Shenhua is also there for some reason. And with that, Shenmue is over. If you're anything like me, you're probably feeling a little conflicted. Those extended periods of time where you're just waiting for events to happen do suck, like I'm being completely honest, they do suck. And while there's distraction to be found in mini games and talking with folk, it's not the most entertaining thing in the world. But at the same time, I really can't undersell the amount of love and attention that was put into this game, and I really did feel it on this subsequent playthrough. There is so much more to this game than I covered, such as calling up your friends on the phone, or waiting until Christmas and New Year's Eve to see special events and costumes. There's so much to be found here, like genuinely. If I were a kid or a young teen in the early 2000s that only had access to a handful of games, I could see myself dedicating an insane amount of time to just exploring Shenmue and seeing all it had to offer. Of course, Shenmue is just one part in a trilogy of games, but I just want to talk about Shenmue 1 and see how it stood on its own. Would I recommend this game to people? Maybe, I mean it's a tough sell. It's not like Yakuza, where every single game is a banger, so you can just recommend those titles to anyone. Shenmue is a very specific game that appeals to a very niche audience. I will say, that niche audience is vocal and keeps Shenmue alive, and it's really endearing to see. 
There's this Twitter account called Shenmue Forever that's been posting since November of 2015, and it's still going strong. What do people even see in it? Well, for me, I just love Ryo and this crazy world he inhabited where everyone spoke like a maniac and fistfights broke out on a daily basis. I just loved exploring every nook and cranny of the different rooms that made up this game, inspecting random objects and finding pointless items. I loved the wacky NPC dialogue and I loved how seriously it told its story, but still having meaningful moments that you'd have with a memorable cast of characters. I guess, despite everything, I still love Shenmue, and I don't think those feelings will ever change. This has been Ash. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to Big Boot Goddamn, Chills MP4, Delaner Knox, Polaroid Jack, Sour Lolita, Borpolis Vunny, Real Settery, Luce, Vento, Sea Crowns, Kiwi Kiwi, V, Andrew, Braystar, Silgon, Amatiramisu, Logan, Sianaru, and Jiva. Thank you guys for your support. Thank you guys for watching to the end of this video. I genuinely love you all. Long live Shenmue. Shenmue forever. That's right. The power of Chan Moo. Hmm.